My name is Joe Battaglia. Um, I'm from New York. Uh, if any of you listen to Off the Hook, I'm Redbird. Um, okay, so the talk today will be on magnetic stripe technology. Uh, I'm going to go over magnetic stripes, how they work, uh, some of the fundamentals behind them, how you could build your own cheap magnetic stripe reader, uh, just like out of junk parts, um, reverse engineering using magnetic stripe re uh, th using this magnetic stripe reader, and uh, and a couple of other things. So I'm going to um, I'll discuss how it's how I got this idea first of all. Um, if any of you have been to New York City, uh, the fare cards that they use for the subway system are based on magnetic stripes. And uh, basically, you go up to a vending machine, you purchase a card, you know, put, put whatever value you want on it, buy a $10 card, and every time you swipe it through a turnstile or, or use a reader in a bus, it deducts your fare, and you get into the bus or the subway system. You could buy all sorts of different metric cards, unlimited cards, uh, reduced fare cards, or whatever. And uh, for the past couple of years, the MTA, who runs the New York City subway system, has been having a problem where uh, people have been going into the subway system, picking up discarded cards uh, that, that have been devalued on the floor. So there's, there's no money left on it. However, they've been picking them up and sort of bending the corner and basically figuring out a way to swipe it to the, through the turnstile and trick it into thinking that there's actually one fare still remaining on the card. And I got into a discussion with a bunch of people about this at one of the 2600 meetings. And we were trying to figure out how it works. And no one really seemed to know how it worked. Um, I asked a bunch of people. They really absolutely had no idea. I went and asked some of the people who were actually doing it. Um, and, and they had no idea as well. And uh, it wasn't necessarily a, a huge problem for the MTA uh, to begin with, because not very many people knew about it. And uh, the people who did know about it really didn't know how it worked. They, were, they would always say, okay, well, I don't know how it works. A friend told me about it, and all I care about is that I get a free ride. Um, except that people started, uh, as, it, as the knowledge started spreading about this, uh, people would go in, jam the vending machines, you know, stick wads of gum where you would, where you would get the card or where you would insert your money, and, uh, and force people to pay them to give them a ride. And, you know, they would charge you, like, half of the fare or whatever, but it was still a problem for them. And so recently they corrected this, but I'll talk about that later. And the discussion was, okay, why, why is this happening? And since nobody knew, I, I kind of wanted to figure it out and decided the only way I was going to do that is to be able to read these cards. And uh, the problem was that they were completely pri uh, proprietary format. There was no way to read these cards with the standard magnetic stripe reader. Every time you would try, you know, it would give you an error. Any, any type of standard reader would not, would not read these cards. Uh, there was no documentation anywhere, obviously, uh, as to how the system worked. So you kind of had to start from scratch. Um, what I did realize, though, after tinkering with it for a while, kind of doing some research uh, behind standard magnetic stripe, um, found out that, OK, well, swiping them across uh, the read head of a standard cassette tape player, you would, you, would hear, you would hear some audio, which is what you guys just cringed at. That's what it sounds like. That's what you would hear if you, if you pass a magnetic stripe over the cassette, uh, cassette head. So my idea was, OK, well, can we interface this to a sound card and write some software to decode it? And that's, that's what I'll talk about today. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the basics of magnetism. I'm sure most of you already know this stuff, but in case you don't, I'm going to go over it. Um, start with magnetic poles. Every magnet has two poles, north and south. Um, I'm sure everyone in here has played with it. You, you, you uh, put like poles together, they repel. You put uh, dislike poles together, north and south, uh, and they attract each other. It's very simple. Um, ferromagnetic materials are materials that, when uh, inserted into a magnetic field, can become magnets themselves. Uh, the coercivity of these materials is a measure of the strength of the magnetic field required to do this. So I'm sure you've all seen you know, people magnetizing uh, uh, screwdrivers so that you can pick up screws and whatnot. So basically, you're making this material a magnet itself. And, uh, and a solenoid is basically a coil of wire, and, and that's all it is. Um, when, you, when, you, when current flows through the wire, it creates a magnetic field. And so on one side would be a north pole, and on the other side would be a south pole. If you reverse the current, it reverses itself. So the south pole is on the other side, and whatever, it flip-flops. Um, it also works in reverse. So when a magnetic field is passing through a solenoid and, and cutting through the solenoid, uh, current is induced within the coil. And if you have it hooked up to an oscilloscope or whatever, you'll, you'll notice a little voltage spike every time a magnetic field passes through it. 
Um, if you look at the magnetic field lines of, of this, which is just a standard bar magnet, uh, near, the, near the surface of, this, uh, of the bar magnet, you'll notice that the field lines are completely horizontal. And so if you were to pass a solenoid over, uh, over the, the surface of a bar magnet, nothing would happen because the field lines aren't cutting through the solenoid. Um, and this is exactly what happens when you pass a reed head over a, an unencoded magnetic stripe. It acts just like a bar magnet. Nothing happens. You don't see, any, you don't see anything. If you look at the junctions between two magnets, you'll notice that with attracting poles, it looks exactly like a bar magnet. The, the flux lines are horizontal. If you were to run a solenoid across the gap, you wouldn't notice anything, any current induced in the coil, and you'd have no data there. Um, however, if you, if you run it across the gap between two poles which repel each other, you'll notice how the field lines kind of go vertical. So very near the surface, all the magnetic field lines are vertical. So passing a solenoid over that would induce current in the coil, and if you had it up, hooked up to an oscilloscope again, you would see a little voltage spike every time you did that. It works with south-south and, and, and uh, poles that repel each other. And so, okay, how do you apply this to uh, magnetic stripes? Well. To make a magnetic stripe, first you take like hundreds and thousands of these little ferromagnetic particles, um, combine them with a binder, which is just basically like a glue, paint them onto a plastic card, uh, ATM card, whatever you want to make, uh, any mag stripe card, and, uh, and ex uh, expose them to a strong magnetic field, which basically aligns all of them, and you allow it to dry. So you have all these hundreds and thousands of little ferromagnetic uh, particles which could potentially become magnets themselves aligned onto a stripe and they're held together, nothing could move them, whatever, they're, they're permanently there. So that's, that's how you make a, a blank mag stripe. Now, when you want to encode a mag stripe, like I, like I mentioned before, you can take a solenoid, apply current, and it essentially itself will become a magnet. So if you, were to, if you were to run this over a magnetic stripe, and as you were running it over the magnetic stripe, flip the current in the solenoid, you would start creating points where, like you saw before, you would have two poles next to each other which would repel each other. And they stay there and the flux lines stay vertical because they're held together with glue. There's, no, there's nowhere they can go. So you create these flux lines. And if you were to take a reed head later, ru uh, run it over the magnetic stripe again, you would notice voltage spikes again, exactly where you would created those flux reversals to begin with. And it's a little bit more difficult to uh, write to a magnetic stripe than it is to read because you have to worry about timing. And it's, it's not that difficult, but I'm not going to cover it here. Um, you have to worry about timing because you don't want to encode only a portion of it or you don't want to, to do it uh, too slowly and re you record off the end because you'll lose data that way. Um, so I'm just going to discuss reading them right now. Okay, so what you want, uh, what we want to, what we're worried about right now is the waveform that you get out of it when you, uh, when you look at the output of the, mag of the magnetic stripe reed head from the point of view of the sound card, for instance. And what you see is, like I mentioned before, a series of flux reversals, which, which are just voltage spikes, um, uh, you know, throughout, uh, throughout the length of the card. And the way that you encode binary data with these is you use a method called Aiken biphase. And in Aiken biphase, it's a form of frequency shift keying, the same sort of stuff that you know the old uh, modems used, and you could hear it. It sounds just kind of like an old like 300 baud modem and whatever. And uh, and you use this, uh, and this is used by setting a frequency uh, to define a zero bit. So let's say, for instance, every every uh, one millimeter on the card. This is an exaggeration. Uh, you, you'd have a flux reversal, and on standard magnetic stripes, you have a series of clocking bits, which basically sets the zero bit frequency for you. So the clocking circuitry within the reader can set that, can use that as a reference. So let's say every millimeter you have a flux reversal, let's say 20 times, and those would be the clocking bits for the card. Then you continue to read and you see, okay, well, there was a spike the next half millimeter, and again, the next half millimeter, that would be a one bit you know, again, the next millimeter you would see a zero bit, and, and I'll demonstrate this for you right now, and it'll be much more obvious. So, just give me a sec. So this is just a standard magnetic stripe. It's uh, it's a st standard encoding. It's the sort of thing you're likely to come across pretty often, you know, in your wallet, ATM card. Um, this specifically is a Starbucks card. Just um, okay. 
So this is the output waveform right here. Okay, so like I said, the first, uh, this is a standard card, so the first 20 or so spikes that you'll see here are clocking bits, and that's how the clocking circuitry for the magnetic stripe reader sets itself to read the cards. So for instance, this will be a zero bit, the next one will be a zero bit, zero bit, and then see how there's two spikes within the same period that there was a zero bit, that's a one bit. So that's how, that's how Aiken biphase works, and that's how you, that's how you uh, decode the binary on a magnetic stripe. And you could sit here and you could decode it by hand. Um, but you don't really want to do that. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so anyway, so the point of, uh, the point of this is to, to write a piece of software, take in the raw data from, from, the, uh, from the magnetic stripe, there's absolutely no hardware involved, and uh, decode it, you get the raw binary out of that. So the benefits of this is, obviously, it's not dependent on any sort of serial parallel PSG port. You know, most laptops don't have them now, so it'll work with most laptops. All the decoding is done in software, so you could analyze proprietary formats, for example, like the MetroCard, um, and you could very easily decode standard formats as well. And it's extremely cheap to make. You don't have to invest any money into it. Um, I'm sure everyone here has a broken cassette tape player somewhere where you could find one very easily. Uh, and let me go back real quick and show you uh, show you how to make one of these. You, you, essentially, all you're doing is you're taking a cassette head and connecting it directly to a 3.5 millimeter jack. And you could snip off the connector in a broken pair of headphones or something, solder it directly onto the read head, which has, depending on whether it's monaural or stereo, either two or three connectors. Um, in, the, in the case of a, a monaural one, it's very easy. You just solder two wires. It doesn't matter which direction. In the case of a stereo head, there will be one common uh, pin and one for the left channel, one for the right channel. It doesn't matter whether you use the right or left channel. It, it works just the same. So that's how you make them. It's extremely cheap, extremely easy. You could build it in you know, less than 10 minutes if you have uh, soldering iron. Um, OK, so let's take a, let's, let's take a look real quick uh, at this, the sort of stuff you're likely to see on the card. If I, if I take the same thing and run it through the software, Okay, that's, just, that's, that's the binary from the data. That's doing essentially exactly what I just explained, looking at, each, uh, looking at the distance between each spike, uh, you know, from, from the initial clocking bits, basically setting, uh, you know, setting a reference and comparing it to each spike, saying, okay, is this a zero or is this a one? And all it's doing is outputting the, the raw binary to standard output. You could take that and pipe it through something to decode the binary, which and you get the exact data that's on the card. And what's nice about this is, is, uh, is everything's documented for standard cards. Uh, there are, there's ISO specs that you can look up, um, and I'll, and I'll uh, mention them later, uh, to, to, to see all of, the, all of the documentation on it. It's all very standard stuff. You can, uh, I mean, I have this software freely available. You could, I'll give you the URLs at the end, um, but it, it, it explains the algorithm to calculate the checksum so you know exactly whether or not you have a good read or not. If I, if I did a poor read, uh, you know, like, I would know right away. Detection failed because it's not, the checksum doesn't match up. So it's, it's very, very reliable for reading standard cards. And there was really no effort involved in, in making this. OK, so this is, uh, I'm not going to go over this too in depth, because this is the sort of stuff you could look up in the ISO specs. but. Um, this is, this is the standard spec for magnetic uh, stripes that you'll find on ATM cards or any standard card that you could read with an off-the-shelf reader. Um, the first track is, the first two tracks are very common tracks. You'll most likely find them on most cards. Um, the first one, uh, as you can see here, has 210 bits per inch, um, seven bits define each character, and you have 79 alphanumeric characters. So that's the alphanumeric track. Um, track two and, and three are numeric tracks. Three has a higher bit density than track two, but it's very, very rarely used. Um, I think the only place I've seen it commonly used is on airport boarding passes. Um, track two is five bits per character, 75 bits per inch, so you could store 40 numeric characters on, on that track. Okay, this is, the, uh, this is the data you're likely to find on a typical financial card. Um, you'll notice this, 